Okay, so you just interviewed Deion. You know, there's part of me that thinks he's getting Colorado attention, which they've never had, and now he's down to like 13 players because he's disassembled He's not it. down to 13 I mean, players. That's such hyperbole. Little, well, that's what this show's all about. Don't you, <laughs> don't you worry a little bit about him running off three quarters with a kid? No. What? No. Colorado was 1-11 last year and lost by an average of 29 points. 29. Like, they were the worst team in the Power Five by a wide margin. Northwestern was the closest to them, right, in terms of, like, really bad teams. Yeah. Northwestern was a one-win team. They lost by an average of 14. 29-14. to 14. He had to clean house. It's absolutely within the rules and as a first-year head coach at a location. You can go in and you can bring in as many you know, first-time scholarships as you want. And he had to clean house. This is going to be a substantially better team. You go from 85 scholarships, even if he only has 60 guys on scholarship, those 60 guys are going to be substantially better than what they had a year ago. This team is going to look nothing like it did, and that's a good thing. And this is what he intended to do right from the get-go. I was you know, involved to a, a certain extent in knowing what his plan was, Yeah. and this was always the plan. He let the, the players know right away what the standard was and then allowed it to, to play out. If you weren't good enough or you didn't want to be uh, accountable to the standard that he was setting, then you're no longer there. So, a couple other things to talk about. Right now, and it's, this was not the case three or four years ago, it appears Michigan is now the class of the Big Ten. Man, I and, mean, and, that's true. And also, it's not just that they beat Ohio State. They have a clear identity. It is now yeah. power football. And by the way, you look at who they're bringing back, this is his best team. Yes. So the, <laughs> this is what is so fascinating is that I would classify both of the last two wins for Michigan as upsets. Um, and Even I, this last year? Even this last year. I, I don't think that Michigan beats that Ohio State team, you know, six out of ten. I okay. think they might beat them three or four out of 10. Like, okay. I'm not saying it's drastically a, a, a difference, but you saw in the game against Georgia with Ohio State, like the talent level is, yes. is very clear. There's some things that happened in that game. I'm not taking anything away because Michigan, they did have an identity and they, they, they beat Ohio State thoroughly. What I am trying to say, though, is that I don't think that would be the case if they did it a third time. No, I, they bring back all the key pieces to me. They have a team that is likely going to be favored to win the Big Ten East, is going to be ranked higher than Ohio State to start the year, and they've beat them their last two games. So your initial premise, I, th there's not an argument. You can't push back against that. Who's the class of the Big Ten currently, today, as we speak? It's Michigan. Yeah. And, and that's even with the talent that Ohio State has accumulated over the last few years. Michigan does have the clear identity. And it's an identity, by the way, that is specifically to beat Ohio State. You know, they target them and they specifically look at them and they're like, what we do gives you trouble. Right. And, and, and that's what's so fascinating about it. This year... That, that East division, and this is the last year that we're going to have divisions in the Big Ten, Penn State's going to start in the top five, Ohio State's going to start in the top five, and Michigan's going to start in the top five. That is going to be an absolute great run in that division. I tend to like irascible characters. No. I, I like people. That doesn't seem like you at all. Brian Kelly. You love Brian most Kelly. Most underrated team in the country is going to be LSU. Why did you used to take shots at Notre Dame, though? Well, first of all. They were very average for a long time. As America's honesty broker, call him as I see him. <laughs> uh, then they got very good with him. They did. Remember, they, the Manti Teo teams got to the national championship. Overachieved. They didn't have any NFL guys. They'd get boxed. At the very end, I good. saw him match up twice with Georgia, lose both close. They could play with anybody. It's like Michigan now. Michigan can beat anybody in the country. Sure. Not saying they would, but they could. Ohio State, for the record, outplayed Georgia and should have beaten them. So let's not make Georgia and all that. They're great. I don't think they'll no, win I mean, they're straight. the class of the sport right now. But Brian Kelly, and I listen, the Notre Dame thing was rocky. The death of a student, um, it was bad. But there, let's, let's be honest. He and Lincoln Riley, this, this was not the case our entire lives with the transfer portal. I think USC and LSU can absolutely play for a national title. Well, this year is going to be a little bit wide open. We, uh, I mean, we touched a little bit on Michigan in terms of a big, big 10 perspective, but let's just look at the now the national perspective of college football. The power teams in terms of recruiting and winning championships, all right, would be Alabama and Georgia. 
if you were to throw one more team in that recruits at that level, you would include Ohio State. Okay? Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, okay. absolutely. All three of those teams are going to be breaking in new quarterbacks. All three of them. Then you've got Michigan. They've got their quarterback, and he's back. You've got a team like LSU, quarterback back. USC, quarterback back. If this, if, if you're looking at and a not year, just quarterbacks, like good ones. Good ones, very good. And Caleb Williams is a generational talent. You've got, you've got Heisman contending quarterbacks back McCarthy, for all three of those. Michigan's guy I see in mock drafts is a late first, early second round. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I mean, he's a talented guy. There's, there's no doubt about it. So now you've got that level of quarterback back. You've got rosters that are getting better at all three locations. They will be better teams next year than they were this last season at all three of those locations. If you're looking for a year in which you're going to get a champion that is not Georgia or not Alabama or not Ohio State, this is the year that you would look towards and not Clemson. I'll, I'll throw them in there because they've kind of dominated the championship landscape to some degree as well. This is, this is the year. Um, and if I'm one of those coaches, if I'm Brian Kelly, Lincoln Riley, Jim Harbaugh, lean into that. Yeah. Go after it. Yeah. You know, set the standard high because the, the fact remains is that it's a quarterback sport. Yeah. As much as we took shots at Stetson Bennett, man, he made plays at times. He's a pretty good athlete. And so th this, is, this is the moment for those teams. We saw TCU make a run, get to the national championship game. You can do it. You don't have to be Georgia and Alabama. Even though Georgia's won back-to-back -back national championships, these teams are going to have a really good shot next year to take it the distance. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, the Big Ten fans are very proud fans. And when USC and UCLA announced they were going to it, you heard this. Oh, cold weather football. Well, they're only going to play four road <laughs> games, okay? And by the way, the last one will be against each other. So the last game UCLA or USC play is in warm weather in Southern California. The latest they can play in the Big Ten is like November 17th, which by and large, mostly it's not snowing. And, and generally speaking, will never be in primetime at night. You know, so you're in the in the daytime in November seventeenth. I mean, listen, it'll it'll be cold. I'm not gonna. Say, I do. But look at I this. Do, I do those games. Here's the here's the Big Ten opponents. Go ahead. So I, I just look at these and I think to myself, it's better for USC and UCLA. I mean, USC in 2024 gets the Michigan fans, the Iowa fans, and the Wisconsin fans. All three travel incredibly well. Sold out stadiums. Washington State, Oregon State. Oregon State's really good. They don't travel like that. So for USC and UCLA, UCLA's had trouble selling tickets. This year, in 2024, they're going to get Ohio State at home. You're going to have 80,000 people at the Rose Bowl. There'll be more Ohio State fans there. Yeah, but that's fine. Yeah, I, but, uh, to your point, yeah, it'll be but full. It's funny when the Big Ten. Same with Nebraska, by the way. When the Big Ten schedules came out, I'm like, this is exactly why they don't. In a very distracted L.A. market, you can sell out the USC-UCLA game. Yeah. But now you get all these Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn State, Nebraska, Ohio State fans. It is so good for the L.A. schools. These are going to be national TV, 80,000. Like, I just can't. I saw the schedules come out, and I was like, God, now you see why they left. I, I Well, y yes. I mean, that's even more so than what they left. They had to leave. They were, they were forced to leave. Look, the, the Pac-12 still doesn't have a media deal. I know. I mean, for crying out loud. Ever, so th that's a totally moot point. They left. They had to. They're in a better spot. Now you look at what is it in practice? What is it in reality? Well, you look at those schedules. That's a really good schedule. It's a good schedule for your home fans. It's a good schedule for parity within the conference. And it's a good schedule to try to compete for a playoff spot. In particular, as we move into 2024 and 25, where we've got the expanded playoff. I love what the Big Ten did in terms of scheduling. I like that they stayed at nine games in the conference. The SEC should absolutely do that. Yeah. It's absurd that we don't play the same schedule makeup across college football. But having said that, the only saying that we're going to – only fixing one game – like the rivalry game, or, or maybe a second for some schools, and then allowing the rest of the schedule to float year to year. Yeah. I think it's going to help the Big Ten in the long run. It's going to drive more parity. Now you're going to try to have four or five really good schools to try to get into a 12-team playoff rather than just scheduling so that one team's undefeated and goes to the BCS or into the college football playoff. So I like what they've done from a scheduling standpoint. And if you're a, a fan, like as, as you are, of these West Coast teams – the idea of going to the Rose Bowl or going to the Coliseum and seeing some of those teams come in, Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin, they travel Nebraska. Like 20, fans. They're going to travel great, and the atmosphere is going to be outstanding.
It's going to be outstanding. And by the way, you're going to be playing in much better windows. You're not going to be playing at 7 p.m. on the West Coast where no one can find your game. You know, what channels? I don't know. It's going to be on prime time, East Coast prime time, I'm talking about. And it's going to be on a network. It's going to be, you know, NBC's got that, that nighttime game now. CBS has that 3.30 game in the Big Ten. You're going to know where you're playing. It's going to be on network television. This deal for USC and UCLA is going to be really good. It really is. I'm very excited. We're about eight weeks out. Um, you have a college football podcast wherever you get podcasts. Um, now, again, a lot of people think I play favorites. I'm discouraged by that, <laughs> but it is what it is. Let's pivot to USC again. Oh, well, I have, we shall. I have had now an NFL executive of note and a college coach tell me. They said, Caleb is a more refined Mahomes at this point. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct. Mahomes, there but ahead co- of his schedule. Well, there was questions about, I remember Mahomes wasn't even the, the number one overall pick. Everyone right now would be like, oh yeah, he was at the top. No, 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 no. There were questions and eyebrows raised when Andy Reid selected him where he did. Wasn't it 14th? Am I making that up? 11, 12, something something along those lines? I've told you this story before, but what was very fascinating about that draft, it was the draft in Philadelphia. John Gruden was still working at ESPN. He was having breakfast in the morning at the hotel. I went down to have breakfast, and he's there. He's like, hey, Clack, come on over here. He's like, what do you think about Mahomes? He raises his eyebrow like this, and I'm like, I thought I had the answer. I was like, well, no one succeeded from that offense, that air raid offense. So I don't know, man. You know, he retreats a lot. I just, I don't see it. That's what I tell him. I said, I, I said, I don't see it. What an idiot I am, right? Who's the idiot? This what, guy. What did he say? He said, you know, all of us who touched Favre, that's who we see. And he says, Andy's taking him tonight. And I was like, whoa. And this was, I was like, that's, that's crazy. And then sure enough, that's what's panned out. Well, here's the deal. Caleb Williams doesn't have those same question marks that Mahomes did yeah. because the offense is more NFL in terms of what Lincoln Riley does. His production is off the charts. His ability to scramble and throw the ball down the field, to create, to do all of those things athletically, have the arm angle and the touch and the power with his arm that only Mahomes had in college. Like, this guy has it all. This is He's, he's the best college quarterback I've seen in a long time, maybe ever. Yeah, I know that. The, listen, the, you just said you talked about hyperbole before. Maybe ever because he is Mahomes, but a better version I at thought, this I, point. I thought. Oh, that. Doesn't... But remember, you could put Andrew in a box. Yeah. Now he was mobile and and powerful. He was phenomenal, and I'm not, you know. But th- this this has like. Williams has like the best parts of of Mahomes and and even Luck and even like an Elway with some of that innate escapability yeah. that Elway had even going back to his Stanford days. I tell you, man, like the only thing that's going to get in Caleb's way is Caleb. Yeah, he and his me, mentality yeah. and and you know all the antics. Well, that's the only thing that's going to get in his way. Yeah, I, th- I thought during Oregon State he got frustrated on the sidelines. They pulled something out of him. Yeah, he, the he, fingernails against Utah. You know things like that. That's th- those are the things that are going to be like, ah. stay away from that. Right. Yeah. I just sounded like you. At least I didn't talk about his backwards hat. You know what? You don't see it on Caleb. He's a grown up. <laughs> You don't see Gun Show, Will Levis. I don't like that nonsense. You don't? No. Levis is great. Love Levis. He's a good kid. Great. I, I'm not saying he's not a good kid. Well, I'm saying he's a I great don't think, kid. He's I don't great think Baker person. Mayfield's a bad kid. No, of but course he's a big, not. Uh, sp- well, you took shots uh, at him. No. I had used data and my eyes to <laughs> data, formulate a very data. strong opinion. I do want to tell you, like, that that series that I had, and the interview came out this week. I talked with Dion, Big Noon Conversations on my podcast, Joel Class Show. The conversations are really good. So so we had Dion this week, over, you know, 30 minutes of a, just a great conversation with Dion. Next week, Nick Saban. We got Greg Sankey coming up all summer. Have you already bi- done the interviews? Yes. Okay. They're already in the can. Uh, all of them in person. And... Chip Kelly's on this. Ryan Day is on this. Every Monday, we're going to drop another really good overarching conversation about college football. Big Noon Conversations, Joel Klatt Show. Check it out this summer. It's a really good series. How's Dion fitting in Boulder? Great. Here's the thing is that D- Dion is a refrigerator, right? He's, he's, he's not the glass of, of milk in the room. The glass of milk is going to turn into whatever temperature the room it's in. Yeah. Dion is going to turn everything around him into his temperature. He, he is the sun. 
He is the gravity. He's the magnet. This is what's so great about him. It's like, oh, they don't have a great recruiting base. No, 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 no. Dion is the recruiting base. This is what you don't understand. Like, is he going to fit in, in Boulder? No, no, no. Is Boulder going to fit with Dion? Yeah. Like, Dion is his own gravitational pull, which is why he's so perfect for them. They need this. Like, they need air to breathe. He makes them absolutely relevant. What did you major in at Colorado? Economics. Really? Yeah. What happened? What? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.